Shalom. Uh, welcome to the ministry of Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, this is our midweek uh, Torah study where we work our way through the Torah, uh, Parsha by Parsha, week by week, uh, and uh, just have a, a weekly meeting with you folks uh, studying the Torah portion. Um, a couple of uh, notes before we begin. Um, if you would like to subscribe to our uh, channel on YouTube, that will allow you to see notifications that when we uh, publish these uh, videos that the videos are available. Likewise, we also have services uh, on uh, Saturday mornings at 11 a.m. here in Fort Myers, and uh, you will get notifications because those are also live streamed. And um, so uh, you can get uh, notifications for both of those things um, if you subscribe. Um, if you have any questions or any discussion or any comments, uh, feel free to uh, offer those in the comments below, or there's an email address in the description of this video, and uh, you're welcome to, uh, to make your uh, comments known by email or in the comments. Uh, I enjoy a good discussion. Occasionally we have some pretty good discussions after these uh, Torah portions, uh, so I would uh, look forward to that if you'd like to, to do that. Lastly, I would like to say that for those of you who do support this ministry, and I know many of you do, uh, I'm just very, very grateful. Uh, we are entirely supported by love offerings and gifts and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so if you would like, uh, if you have been doing that, uh, again, thank you. And if you would like to, uh, to join us in support of this ministry um, and the work of uh, Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue, um, then uh, you're welcome to do that. There will be a link in the description below to our Easy Tithe website, uh, which allows you to uh, make an offering online or make a contribution online. Uh, without further delay, let's get started, if we can here. Uh, this week we are looking at Baloha. Uh, when you set up, this is Bamidbar Numbers chapter 8 uh, through chapter 12, verse 16. All right, let's begin. Uh, Aaron is, is taught the method for lighting the menorah. Uh, Moses, we're just going to begin with a, a summary like we typically do. Moses sanctifies the Levites to work in the Mishkan. The tabernacle is called the Mishkan in Hebrew. They replace the firstborn who were uh, disqualified after sinning with the golden calf. After five years of training, the Levites serve in the Mishkan from ages 30 to 50. Afterwards, they engage in less strenuous work. So there's a retirement program. Uh, around the Mishkan. One year after their exodus from Egypt, Adonai commands Moses concerning the Pesach offering. Uh, those ineligible for the Pesach uh, offering request uh, a remedy, and Adonai gives them the mitzvah of Pesach Shini. The later. Miraculous clouds that hover near the Mishkan signal when it's time to travel, when it's time to camp. Two silver trumpets summon the princes for the entire nation uh, for announcements. The, trump the, the, the trumpets also signal travel plans, war, or festivals. The order in which the tribes march is specified. Moses invites his father-in-law, uh, Yitro, um, to join the children of Israel, but Yitro uh, returns to Midian. Um, some of the people complain about the manna. Uh, Moses protests that he is unable to govern the nation alone. Adonai tells him to select 70 elders, which was, uh, later becomes the Sanhedrin, to assist him. And he informs him that the people will be given meat until they are sick of it. Two candidates for the group of elders prophesy beyond their mandate, foretelling that Joshua instead of Moses will bring the people into Canaan, um, according to tradition. Some protest, including Joshua, but Moses is pleased that others have become prophets. Adonai sends an incessant supply of quail for those who complained that they lacked meat. A plague punishes those who complained. Miriam makes uh, a remark um, that uh, to Aaron, which uh, suggests that Moses is, is just like all the other prophets, but Adonai explains that Moses' prophecy is superior to that of any other prophet. Um, and because Miriam had uh, had uh, disrespected Moses in this way, Miriam is struck with Zadaat, uh, as if she had gossiped about her brother. Moses prays for her, and the nation waits until she is cured before traveling. Um, the summary uh, this week is from Or Sameach. 
Uh, so uh, if you're interested in those, um, you can go to their website, which uh, has a great deal of um, uh, material for you to look at. Okay, let us begin. The first place I want to begin this week um, is, is this, uh, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Excuse me. <clears throat> chapter 8, verse 1 says this, Speak to Ad, uh, Aaron and say to him, When you erect the lamps, the seven lamps are to illuminate the area in front of the menorah. Aaron did so. He erected the lamps facing forward, so they illuminated the area in front of the, the menorah, just as Adonai had commanded Moses. Now this is how the menorah was made, hammered gold from its base to its blossoms, just as was the pattern that Adonai had shown to Moses, so he made the menorah. A couple things to note regarding this menorah. It's a single piece of hammered, uh, a single piece of gold hammered. It, it would have been fashioned out of solid gold. Uh, in other words, not a uh, something that was carved out of wood and then plated with gold. Um, uh, from Exodus chapter five, uh, chapter 25, we have this, Shemot 25, verse 30. Always set the bread of the presence on the table before me. Uh, and in the Hebrew, we have this, Venatata al hashulchan lechem panim lefenetamid. Literally, you shall set on the table of the bread of the presence before me always. But do you hear the words pene panim um, in, in here? Uh, panim, lechem panim. Uh, this can be translated as the face. Uh, this Again, we're back in Shemot chapter 25 for this. Now back to our current Parsha, verse 2. Speak to Aaron and say to him, when you erect the lamps, the seven lamps are to illuminate the area in front of the menorah. So listen to the Hebrew, Deber el Aaron ve'amarta elav ba'aloha et hanarot el mul panei ha'menorah ya'iru shivat hanarot. Speak to Aaron and say to him, when you arrange the lamps over against the face of the lampstand, the menorah, uh, shall give light to the seven lamps. Uh, the the uh, Shivat Tanarot is the, the seven lamps. Um, Aaron did so, verse 3, he erected the lamps facing forward. Vayasken Aaron el Molpene ha menorah. Ha'ela neroteha ke'asher tziva Adonai Moshe. Just as Adonai had commanded Moses. And so uh, in literally, in English, literal translation, uh, Aaron uh, did uh, towards the face of the lampstand and arranged to face the lamps as commanded Adonai, uh, as Adonai commanded Moses. Uh, so we've got this again facing forward, El Mul Pene Amenorah, and then uh, um, in front of uh, the, um, the menorah. Um, so we see the table of showbread which was the Exodus 25 passage, um, the table of showbread and the menorah, both we see this word. So significant about this pene. Uh, pene is a Hebrew word, um, and, and we see this word um, f from time to time in the text, in, in a few significant places. What's, what's the first place that we remember seeing this idea of, of uh, pene le panim, face to face? In Genesis 2, many of you have heard me teach on this. In Genesis 2, we have the Azer Konegdo, which is translated in, in, most transla in, in most Bibles as the suitable companion. Uh, in, in literal Hebrew, it means the companion to my face, the Adzer Konegdo. Um, in, in Exodus 26, we have the Parachet, Shemot 26. We have the Parachet, the curtain that divides the holy from the most holy place in the Mishkan. Woven into the curtain were two Cherovim, copying the two that were on the cover for the Ark. The uh, Kaporet, Aron Ha'edut, covering the Ark of the Testimony. The two Cherovim on the Ark of the Testimony are facing each other. Uh, the two cherovim in the curtain, the parachet, were facing each other. In Exodus 25, we had the, the depiction of the cherovim on the ark. They're facing each other. It says this, Upenachem ish el They shall face each other. Uh, okay, so again, see, we've got some multiple 
instances of this face to face what is the significance of this what is what is happening with this uh shemot chapter 33 adonai spoke with moses face to face as a man speaks with his friends vedaber adonai el moshe panim el panim uh keasher yadaber ish el rehu uh, one thing I have asked of Adonai, that which I will seek from Psalm 27, to dwell in the house of Adonai all the days of my life, to behold the beauty. Uh, and then later we have uh, from Psalm 27, that was verse 4, um, to behold the beauty of Adonai. Um, verse uh, 4, continuing and to meditate in his temple. Uh, again, verse 5, for in the day of trouble you hide me in a sukkah his tabernacle, his dwelling place, and conceal me in the shelter of his tent, which is a reference to Moses in his tent of meeting. Set me high on a rock, it says, verse 5, which is a reference to Moses on the mountain. Verse 6, Then will my head be high above my enemies around me. In his tabernacle, in his mishkan, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, sing praises to Adonai, Hear Adonai when I call with my voice. Again, we're reading from Psalm 27. Hear Adonai when I call with my voice. Be gracious to me and answer me. Verse 8, to you my heart says, seek my face. Your face, Adonai, I seek. Verse 9, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. So, um, and, then, and then do not abandon me or forsake me. O oh God, my salvation. And we, we, when we conclude the psalm, uh, or conclude this passage anyway, with, with this reference to the salvation of Adonai. Um, so, so we see that, that this idea of this face-to-face -face is um, something that Adonai has woven uh, by his word here into the sentiment of, of Psalm 27. Uh, going back to Numbers chapter 6, Bamidbar chapter 6, Remember when um, Adonai says to Moses, this, this is how you shall place my name upon the people. This is, of course, the, the blessing. Adonai said to Moses, uh, speak to Aaron and his sons, tell them this is how you are to bless the people of Israel. You are to say to them, Iverecha Adonai Yereshmerecha, Ya'er Adonai Panav, Panav Alecha, Vichinecha, Yisa Adonai Panav, Alecha Ve'asem Lecha Shalom. Uh, uh, in English, may Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai make his face to shine upon you and show you his favor. May Adonai lift up his face toward you and give you peace. Um, uh, we, we say countenance sometimes. We say face and countenance sometimes, but it's the, the same word, panav, panav. In this way, they are to put my name on the people of Israel, so I will bless them. Um, what, what, is, what is the favor of Adonai. What does it mean to have the favor of Adonai? To see the name of Adonai, Redeemer and King, upon you. This is this is what it means to be. Um, it means to be like a child before Adonai. To be a cheriv, uh before Adonai. Uh, this this um, this word, these um, cherevim, uh, that we see uh, in tradition, they are childlike in in their the way they appear, and while I, and I, and I've taught on this before, and um, we have in our modern culture the idea of cherubs, and these cherubs are you see them on Hallmark cards and this kind of thing. You know, it's it's the idea of the little baby with the wings and the halo and the and and the angelic sort of look to them, and uh, on the in the first place, I'm I'm a little offended and indignant at that portrayal, because the cherubim are clearly angelic beings and and clearly uh, beings that are holy and not meant to be uh, dishonored by such a uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, trite reference or or depiction. But I have to say that 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 I do have to consider that in in our tradition, of course that the cherv is, is a childlike angelic being. And I believe that what that means is that it's a reference to us being the children of Adonai. Remember, we're called B'nai Israel, the children of Adonai, the, 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 the offspring of Adonai. Um, and, and, and that's what we have here, is uh, the favor of Adonai 
for a child of Adonai, which the favor of Adonai is this idea of, of, of seeing uh, his name um, uh, upon us and of, um, of, of acknowledging that we are his charuv, uh, we are his children. Okay, uh, moving on in this portion, uh, two aspects that I want to look at. Um, so what we have is we have this phrase, when the ark would set out, Moses would say, advance, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered, may your flows uh, flee from before you. And when it was halted, he would say, return, O Lord, you who are Israel's myriads of thousands. Um, some of you would re remember this or recognize this from our liturgy. Uh, advance, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered. Um, if you have a Chumash or, or a Hebrew text, a, text, a Torah text showing the original Hebrew Torah script, uh, not just uh, the Hebrew words, but um, it needs to be a Torah text, uh, Chumash uh, or, or, or something like that. Um, if you turn to this passage here, uh, with chapter 10, verse 35 and 36, um, and, and, and what you'll see here is this. You will see something remarkable. In the Torah text, it'll have this, an inverted nun, or a, a inverted uh, backwards nun, uh, at the beginning of verse 35 and at the end of verse 36. Um, let's see if I have this on my screen here. Um, I should have it. Shouldn't I have it? Maybe. Maybe I can bring this up for you, mm. or maybe not. Let me see if I've got it in a different place. I thought I had this prepped for you. I'm sorry about the delay. Let's see if I've got it. Balocha, balocha, balocha. Um, let me do it a different way. Let's go this way, and then we'll go here. Appreciate your patience, of course. We're going to go Bamidbar uh, 10. And here we go, 35 and 36. Let's scroll down. Okay. Um, what you will see on your screen, perhaps, if I can get it right, is this. Let me get it as big as I can here. Alrighty, let's do this. Okay. On your screen you see the Safaria website. Uh, we use Safaria for a lot of different things here. Uh, Safaria.org. And you'll see I am in Numbers, Bamidbar, Chapter 10. And you'll see on your screen, perhaps, uh, you'll see the text, the Torah text. Uh, and then, of course, the English translation below it down here. Look what we see right here. Can you see that on your screen? It is a backwards nun, an inverted nun. And then if you look down here, look what we got over here at the end of verse 36. Beginning of verse 35, we got the inverted nun, and at the end of verse 36, the inverted nun. See that? So what on earth does that mean? Let me close that, and let's go back to this look. <laughs> you get to look at me some more. What, what does that mean? What's happening there? Um, it's these two verses. When the ark would set out, Moses would say, Advance, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered, may your foes flee from before you. When it was halted, he would say, Return, O Lord, you who are Israel's myriads of thousands. Um, the Talmud suggests this, that... There are actually three books contained in what is our modern book of, of Numbers. The first book is book 1 through verse 34 of chapter 10. Book 2 is these two verses, and then book 3 is verse 37 to the end of Numbers. Why would the Talmud make this conclusion on the inverted nuns? And if it were true, then why doesn't the Torah indicate seven books of Torah, or perhaps the Numbers broken into two books with this passage and one or the other? So this statement by Talmud makes us question what is happening before, during, after these two verses. Before these two verses, we've got the Mishkan and the priests, 
and for the most part Israel is doing well with Adonai. For the most part Israel is 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 being diligent and faithful and good. Um, the only real mistakes that were made uh, during the time of building the the Mishkan and the priests and the sa uh, sanctification, consecration, everything, um, the only real mistakes that we have is at the dedication of the Mishkan, Aaron's two sons um, uh, stepped out of line and uh, offered strange fire before Adonai. But that's the only time that that anything goes wrong, and it appears that for the most part Israel's doing well with Adonai. Um, but but then perhaps the honeymoon is over and they're settling into covenant life. What's next? What's next is the journey into the promised land, into Canaan to conquer the land. It is an 11-day journey from where they are. In a few days, we will have this. All of it will, will in a few days, will be on the cusp of entering the promised land. So what I want you to see is is that we have this before the, the preparation of the covenant, then we have the during, which is the, the march to Canaan, and then we have following Adonai in covenant and in his presence. And what do we see coming in the passage after these two verses? After this, the people begin to crumble. Ve'ahi ha'am kemit onenin ra. Ra means bad, opposite of good. Um, and so we've got the member from the tree of knowledge, uh, the knowledge of Tov and Ra. Um, and so the, the, the people began to grumble. And, and it's interesting that in the text here, it says that in the Hebrew, they began to have a grumble. They began to have a complaint almost. Uh, in a sense, they didn't have anything really to complain about, but they began to kind of grumble and, and, uh, and, and murmur, if you will. In response to this, it displeased Adonai, and, and a fire began at the outskirts of the camp and consumed some of them. Some of them were burnt. For me, this speaks of how grumbling can infect a community, like a fire that begins on the edges but slowly creeps into the camp. And then it says this in verse 4, Next, the mixed crowd that was with them grew greedy for an easier life, while the people of Israel, for their part, also renewed their weeping and said, If only we had meat to eat. One of the things you have to acknowledge here in this, this section is the distinction between the mixed crowd, the mixed multitude, and the people of Israel. And the mixed multitude in this section refers to those who came out of Egypt. And we have a distinction here. Now both of these are failing and being faithless and grumbling and complaining, which isn't good. But there's a distinction. And I find that to be... Um, uh, I, I'm disappointed at that, that there had to be a distinction at this point. Uh, verse 7, the man, uh, by the way, uh, the man, manna, uh, by the way, was like coriander seed and white like gum resin. The people would go around gathering it and would grind it up in mills or pound it to paste with mortar and pestle. They would cook it in pots and make it into loaves that tasted like cakes baked with olive oil. This is verse 7. Uh, notice what they are doing. They are are creating recipes for the manna. And on the one hand, we might think, well, that's creative of them. Um, it could have been eaten whole, just as it was. It could have just been gathered up and eaten. But they felt they needed to grind it and cook it and change it. A couple things that are happening here. The, the, the human experience uh, struggles with boredom. Let's just be honest about that. The human experience struggles with boredom and dissatisfaction. And... There's two things that are happening here. The people are becoming bored and the people are becoming dissatisfied. And so they feel like they have a need to grind it and cook it and change it. It's as if they're trying to recreate something. They're trying to insert themselves into the process. Um, one illustration of this is, is the illustration of artificial insemination. Um, artificial insemination is necessary when couples can't conceive uh, because of a physiological problem. Uh, it's absolutely necessary. It's a good thing because it brings about life. So so we do that when it's necessary. But what if a couple went ahead with this procedure of artificial insemination because when it wasn't necessary? Y you see, it would be like unnecessarily inserting technology into the process. It's not necessary. When this is necessary for life and well-being, that's fine. But when it's unnecessary is when you run into problems, just like the builders of the Tower of Babel. 
they bricked bricks. They inserted technology into the process in order to excise Adonai out of their lives. It's a statement of taking ownership and an exclusive kind of ownership where you excise, where you remove Adonai from your life. Okay. Uh, they all began to complain, family after family, so it grew like fire. Moses heard the people crying, verse 10, family after family, each person at the entrance to his tent. The anger of Adonai flared up violently, and Moses too was displeased. Verse 18, tell the people, consecrate your... So the fire ravaged through um, uh, the land, um, and then Adonai was, was upset with their continuing to complain. Uh, Moses was uh, displeased as well. And Adonai says this, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow you will eat meat, because you cried in the ears of Adonai if only we had meat to eat. We had the good life in Egypt. All right, Adonai is going to give you meat and you will eat it. You won't just eat it one day or two days or five or ten or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nose and you hate it. Because you have rejected Adonai, who is here with you, and distressed him with your crying and your asking, Why did we ever leave Egypt? So Adonai is going to give them meat, but what does he do? Adonai sent out a wind which brought the quails from across the sea and let them fall near the camp, about a day's trip away on each side of the camp and all around it, covering the ground to a depth of three feet. The people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day gathering the quails. The person gathering the least collected ten heaps. Then they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. So, I mean, just think of the absurdity of this. Uh, a day's trip away on each side of the camp. So a healthy person can walk 20 miles in a day. Um, a very healthy person can, can walk 20, uh, a marathon or run a marathon, but, but a reasonable number is about 20 miles a day. So surrounding this camp, 20 miles in all directions, to a depth of three feet, there were dead quail. And so they went out and they started gathering it. And they gathered and they gathered and they gathered until they had like ten heaps. Adonai sent them quail from the sky. Where does the manna come from? The manna likewise comes from the sky. But look what the people complained about. and Look what they asked for. They didn't ask for man, uh, quail from the sky. Look what they asked for. Verse 5, we remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt. It cost us nothing. It was free. And the cucumbers and the melons, the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now we're withering away. We have nothing to look at but this man. Manna. Um, the Hebrew word for it is man. Uh, the English anglicized way of saying it is manna. Remember the fish. The cucumbers and melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic. I don't know about cucumbers and melons, but I know leeks and onions and garlic are peculiar. In what way are they peculiar? In what way are they like fish? Well, onions, garlics, and leeks grow underground. Fish live underwater. Do you see what's happening here? We've got a, a contrast. Notice that the fish comes from under the water, the vegetables from the ground, leeks and onions from the ground. Adonai's food that he's providing for them comes from heaven, called the bread of heaven. But the people want to take the manna and reprocess it. They want to take the food that comes from the ground instead of the food that is uh, coming from the sky, from the heavens. Interesting to note that the curse of the garden was, you shall eat by the sweat of your brow. But Pharaoh made them provide for others by their slavery, the sweat of their brow. So Adonai sends them food by a wind. I want you to key on this word wind, and let's talk about this. Verse uh, 16, Adonai said to Moses, Bring me 70 of the leaders of Israel, people you recognize as leaders of the people and officers. Bring them to the tent of meeting. Have them stand here, there with you. Verse 17, I will come down and speak with you there, and I'll take some of the spirit which rests on you and put it on them. Then they will carry the burden of the people along with you so that you won't carry it yourself alone. Moses went out and told the people what Adonai had said. Then he collected 70 of the leaders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Adonai came down in the clouds, spoke to him, took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 leaders. When the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied at that time, but not afterwards. There were two men who stayed in the camp for 26, one named Eldad, the other one Medad. The spirit came to rest on them. They are among those listed to go out to the tent, but they hadn't done so, and they prophesied in the camp. 
A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, from his youth up, had been Moses' assistant, answered, My lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you so zealous to protect me? I wish all of Adonai's people were prophets. I wish Adonai would put a spirit on all of them. So, here's what I want to draw out of this. Is Adonai brought his spirit with them in spite of their rebellion and in spite of their um, their inability to do something other than grumble and complain. And I think for me, what it speaks to is that, um, you know, first of all, the human animal is is compulsively recreating. I mean, that's that's what modern day technology is. Is uh, we used to use uh, a hammer and chisel, and then we used uh, papyrus, and we used uh, lambskin and and uh, pigments, and and then we somewhere along the way developed uh, paper and then we began to bind books and then we began to uh, uh, experiment and explore inks and, and different things and then typewriters and, and then digital word processors and printers and then digital documents and now many of our documents um, I, I, I can't I can't imagine can't can't believe how many documents I have in my computer um, you know, as far as the writings that I do and, and, and so forth. Um, so it's just, it's just a, a mountain of, uh, of writing that we have. And we continue to, to reinvent writing and communication in that sense. Um, and, and, and what we see here is the insatiable desire of humankind to recreate things and the insatiable desire in humankind to grumble and complain. Um, and so I, I think putting those two together is, is interesting and the response that Adonai has when he takes the spirit and puts the spirit on them is I think for me an indication and, and certainly during this time of the year around the Pentecost and, and uh, Shavuot um, where the spirit uh, figured so so prominently um, after the ascension of Yeshua it's it's this idea that that it is by the spirit that I will live and grow and be able to overcome and and be able to um, be victorious um, against my first of all my attempts at reinvention of, of things that that's unnecessary um, and my inclination towards uh, towards um, towards grumbling and complaining which I think somehow there is a link, and, and maybe we can save this for another discussion at another time, but I think there is a link to those two sentiments. First of all, it is the sentiment of, of recreating, of, of taking creation and, and, and the, the, the raw materials that God has given us and then turning that in, and recreating that into another sort of expression. And uh, we see that in modern times with... Um, uh, recreating of, of relationships, recreating of um, of, um, of roles and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, so, so that's pretty prevalent. That combined with the, the, the sentiment of, of sort of grumbling and almost like a, a vague dissatisfaction, a complaint, if you will, um, and, and, and that's the nature of it. Sometimes our children, if, if you've had children, uh, sometimes our children will just complain for no good reason. And it's just like, why are you complaining? You're just being complaining. You're just being whiny. And, and it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's, it's illustrative because that's the human condition. that We just find dissatisfaction in things, and, uh, and that expresses itself first in, in our complaining and then in our, our desire to recreate things in a different image. All right, um, moving on. Um, let's see if I want to get into this. Um, yeah, just some more comments, more comments. Um, all 
let's see. I'm just trying to going through my notes here. Um, I think what I would like to say is um, going back to the beginning. When we first started this, we talked about the menorah having a face, the showbread having showbread having a face, um, and and the 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 menorah and the showbread facing each other across the room of the Mishkan, uh, the same as the Keravim. Um uh, the flame is everlasting. The bread of heaven is always available. Uh, these two sort of um, corresponding elements in the Mishkan. Uh, in in what ways do they correspond? Uh, the the bread of heaven is on display. It is something for you to look at. Um, the light is something by which you look at something. Uh, if you had light but nothing to look at, the light would, would be a waste. If you had something to look at but no light to see by, then the thing you were supposed to see would be a wasted because you couldn't see it because there's no light. So these two things work together. They, they, they correspond each other, if you will. And I think that there, there's something to that. Um, we see this, of course, most obviously in the marital relationship where the husband and wife correspond to each other. This is what it means, the Zer Konegdo, the you are a companion to my face. You are the one who is face to face with me. We correspond to each other. Um, and I, I think that's that's what is being uh, indicated here or alluded to here. Uh, and, and, and yet in the context here, we've got the spirit being given um, a little while later. And for me, it's... Um, it's it's just real important that the spirit is that corresponding sort of connection that we have to Adonai. It is uh, it is the opposite of me in that it's not me, um, but it's it's something that I confront face to face. Um, it is the the uh, the present spiritual reality of Adonai in my life. And um, it is a spirit, um, and uh, we we live lives by by the spirit, uh, of course, um, uh, because we live lives of faith. So that's what I would say, uh, just as a last comment on uh, the face of the showbread and the face of the menorah, um, as if they're looking at each other across the Mishkan, and um, uh, that. Uh, yeah, it's it's just again a a uh, a symbol of what corresponds to us in our relationship with Adonai. Um, it isn't just that we've received atonement, but that we have received a corresponding element of us to enter into relationship with. Um, we can't, you know, you 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 have to have a relationship with somebody that's to your face, and. And, and, and we can't have that with the creator God of the universe, Adonai. There's no way that we can have that in our current frame, in our current condition. We have the atonement of Yeshua, so spiritually we're able to stand in his presence. But I can't with these eyes um, go and, 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 and look at him and see him. Um, and so the spirit is his emissary to correspond to me, to come to me face to face. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Um, well, if he stands at the door and knock and the door is the door to my heart, he must be to my face. He must be face to face with me. Uh, so I just think it's the grace of Adonai that he provided uh, this sort of face to face corresponding counterpart to us, which is him. It's holy and it's it's him. Um, and so it's every bit all of Adonai, but it's a corresponding counterpoint to us. Uh, in that it uh, it comes to us to engage in relationship. And in this frame, in this reality, in this present day, that is the context for our relationship. That is how we do face-to-face. -face. Um, and, and, and I think uh, when it comes to uh, the menorah and the showbread, um, Yeshua is the, the, the bread of heaven, and um, he calls himself the bread of life, and, and, and uh, he calls us the light of the world. So that's how I see it. There's other ways to look at that, of course, uh, but I, I, I think that that's encouraging to me and it hopefully is, is encouraging to you. I will conclude with that this week. Once again, it's been a delight with you and uh, I just trust that, that Adonai will guide you and keep you this week. 
Uh, please reach out to me with any questions or comments that you might have. And may Adonai bless you. Shalom, shalom.